And welcome to Forum 360, a program with a global outlook and a local view. I'm your host, Bill Steven Saus, and today we're going to talk about the world of entertainment and media in Northeast Ohio. Uh, we serve the Western Reserve area, and this is a great opportunity to talk about uh, the history and some of the highlights of media, especially electronic media, radio, TV, but also some some books and magazines. Our special guest is a veteran uh, journalist in the area, and he has been very active as an educator and a writer of books. Uh, Mike Olszewski. Hey, from, Bill, thanks very much. Good to have you with us, Michael. Happy to be here. And we're going to talk about your books. And okay. As an author, uh, you brought several of your books. Yeah. And let's talk a little bit about your background, and then we'll move a little bit into your writing style. Okay, fine. Uh, you know, I was always kind of uh, entranced by popular culture growing up, as, as we were too, right. during a golden age of popular culture, as a matter of fact. And I grew up on this sort of thing. And, uh, you know, I decided I wanted to get into radio. I uh, did get into radio. Uh, I even did some TV until they told me to go back to radio. <laughs> uh, but uh, at any rate, loved the time in popular culture. And my wife Janice and I were, got to know so many of the pioneers because, you know, people don't realize that Cleveland media isn't as old as a lot of people think. You know, I mean, people look at popular culture like it's tap water. They turn it right. off, they turn it on when they need it. But uh, these people influence us so heavily. And we would hear these wonderful stories from the pioneers. And we thought, you know what? It's the stories that you want to hear. It's important to know that WEWS went on the air in 1947, but what went into the whole process to put it on the Channel air? Channel 5. Yeah, That's exactly. Channel. So uh, we decided to start writing books and to get as many of these stories down as we could. And uh, it's turned into something wonderful because so many people come up to us at various appearances at libraries or pop culture conventions, and they have their own stories to, to tell. And a lot of times, you know, here's another thing to keep in mind. You know, urban f urban legends, I guess, take over with a lot of the people that we grew up with. Right. And we wanted to clear a lot of that stuff up because, quite honestly, if something is written and it's incorrect, very few people will go through the process of correcting it and it becomes the historical record. You've just changed a historical record with an urban folklore. Right, that so, happens a lot nowadays with yeah, social so, media. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, so we wanted to make sure that didn't happen. Now, let's say, to educate you, in you got started... Uh, Kent State University was very important in your life, correct? Yeah, it sure was. It was the first college I went to. I graduated from Kent with uh, two degrees as well as uh, one from Kent from uh, Cleveland State. And, uh, you know, it's, this is really kind of unsettling. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the events of May 4th, which, you know, really kind of uh, turned popular culture around. Right. I was teaching one course, and uh, I was, it was called Making Sense of the 60s. And um, I told everybody, when did the era of the 1960s begin? No one is really sure. When is it? Was it the civil rights movement? Well, it really started in the 50s. Uh, was it the space race? Was it television? No one really knows. There's like no one set date. Right, exactly. However, most historians would agree that the era of the 1960s ended on May 4th. Wow. And I would just point outside the window and said, it, right over there. By right, that, there. right there. Right yeah. there. And uh, sadly, so many of the students now don't know what happened on May 4th. On the campus. And uh, I've spoken to many of the survivors of the May 4th shooting, and they say, you know, uh, sadly, they're seeing that same trend. And, you know, we learned lessons there that we should, we should not forget. Right. And there, there are uh, people out there that are still researching, and I remember uh, talking to many people that were there. Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, some I've talked to that were uh, actually shot yeah. um, and survived. But there is a, uh, also a, a great media uh, involvement, Cleveland Media at Kent State, uh, probably a predecessor of yours in, in the, on the faculty there, Bill Randall was very active. Oh, yeah. Bill Randall, Bob West, both of them. Yeah. Right. And sure. uh, they brought Elvis Presley. They brought uh, yeah. many of the great uh, rock and roll, pre-rock and rollers. You know, it's interesting now, because to Cleveland. Randall would call my house every once in a while. And he was, I liked Bill. But it would go like this, bring, hello, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. And 20 minutes later, I'd say, okay, see you later. My wife would look at me and say, that was Bill Randall, wasn't it? Because right, <laughs> yeah. he didn't care what you had to say. The guy had He'd an ego talking. as big as the city, <laughs> but he could back it up. And he was Kent State uh, for many years. He sure was. And we also think of the early days uh, in Akron, uh, 1590 WAKR, oh, of course. 850 WJW in Cleveland, where a famous... Broadcaster, you want to talk a little bit about the original rock and roller uh, who brought 
rock and roll in Cleveland. I'll tell you what, WAKR was known for a lot of great personalities. Believe it or not, Art Fleming, right. the original host of Jeopardy, right. was there. He was the morning guy. Scott Muni was one of the great voices of New, New York, York Radio. City, right? But uh, this guy named Alan Freed started Alan out at Freed, WAKR. That's the one we're looking yeah. for. And uh, he did everything there. I mean, before he started getting into the rock and roll thing, he had a classical music show. He did sports. He called games and uh, fit into a niche. Interesting point, when he was in Akron, he started the Alan Freed School of Broadcasting. Okay. No one attended. No one attended. It went attended. down pretty quick. <laughs> but uh, when he got to Cleveland, you know, his star began to rise there. Exactly. So. Now, there was also, uh, I remember as a youngster, you probably too, about the same era, uh, Baxter and Riley at oh. WERE, Jeff Baxter. And of course, uh, Jack Riley. Yeah, sure. And Jack Riley went to Hollywood. People remember him from the Bob Newhart show, yeah. where he played the neurotic uh, Mr. Carlin. Yeah, exactly. But, uh, he was he was he moved out with uh, Tim Conway, who was one of his uh, friends. He sure did, and Ernie Anderson. Ernie and they Anderson. wanted Lynn Sheldon to follow them, but he Gilardi. said Gilardi. was Ernie Anderson. Oh yeah, but greatest said, well, voice. These, these guys, they, they're living three in an apartment. He said, I'm the highest paid guy in Cleveland. I'm not going out there. Uh, interesting thing, there was another personality that came out of WERE. I met up with this guy one day, and uh, I said, uh, is this your first time in Cleveland? And he said, no. He says, I worked at WERE for a year. I said, well, what's, what happened? Well, it turns out that his uncle, uh, actually, his uncle was uh, Adlai Stevenson, who was, you know, presidential candidate. Right. And he called up the head of WERE, who was also the head of the Democratic Party. And he said, my kid's thinking about getting into show business, or my, my nephew, can you give him a job? He said, sure, we'll make him the promotion guy. His job was to stand between Bob Neal and Jimmy Dudley. Well, those are two baseball Who uh, hated each other's Baseball guts. announcers, yeah. They would not stay in the same hotel because they might breathe the same air. As right. they hated, and he would stand between them. And sometimes, you know, even when they were on the road, and he'd say, uh, would you please tell that idiot that I need the scores from last night? He says, well, you know, he needs, he's, tell, tell that fool that I put him on top. He's, he put him on top of your typewriter. Went back and forth like that. So what happened was, he's, uh, uh, you know, after a year, he says, that's it. He says, there no, there's no future here. I'm going out to Hollywood. Let's it leave. was McLean Stevenson. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so it was because of these two guys that he went on to become from you know, from MASH and yeah, everything else. Right. But I remember when he told me, he said, there was no future in, in broadcasting right. for him no. in Cleveland. No. So. But, but Cleveland it was, had enough radio and television uh, news and uh, visions for people moving on in the different broadcasting fields that you were able to write several books. Yeah. I want to talk about your books. So, uh, sure. Give me, uh, let's pick up one. Uh, this is a good one. Smoky, sweaty, rowdy, and loud. You know, can I just clear something up? That's not a description of the authors, okay? <laughs> really, I get that all the time. Uh, so Cleveland's legendary rock and roll yeah. landmarks and Mike and Janice Olszewski are the authors. Uh, in this book, uh, there's talk about the various uh, nightclubs, oh, yeah. the arenas, uh, municipal stadium, and uh, they are a part of the Cleveland area, uh, La Cave and Euclid sure. Avenue, the Coliseum, which no longer exists in Richfield yeah. on Route 303, uh, you know, and the Swingos, uh, oh, yeah. many of the smaller uh, bars, uh, the Agora, which uh, uh, rock and rollers uh, attended. Sure, Gleason's, uh, Not too of far from Cleveland State. You know, an interesting point in there is there was a bar called Gleason's, and it was on the uh, it was an inner city bar, and uh, they used to have people like, oh my gosh, Ray Charles, James Brown, people like that. Now, here is an interesting thing, and I wasn't able to get uh, hold of anybody about this. When you signed on to work at Gleason's, they paid you for eight hours. Wow. If you're on stage for four, you're working another four. It's worth it. So it's worth going to work. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so James Brown said, well, the only thing I will do is I'll haul beer. But that's it. So he hauled beer for four hours. Uh, I don't know what Ray Charles did, okay. you know, quite honestly. Right, right. But uh, he was obviously a very bright guy. But the thing about Gleason's was I talked to some of the people that went there, and they used to have little paper hats that said okay. Gleason's. And if you were from out of town or country, as they called you, you'd put on the little hat. They all, always knew the local people from the country people. Exactly, yeah, exactly. So. That is a good... A good way of remembering all these old places in yep. Cleveland. Uh, Leo's Casino. Was Leo's was an amazing place. In fact, when I was at WOIO, uh, it, it's funny because we were covering the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and uh, we covered this from you know five years, ten years, whatever it was, until it's finally opening. And about a month before it opened, and we did so many stories. And I was working at WMMS at the time, and Milt Maltz was on the board, and he wanted to know if there was a story that broke and we didn't get it, why didn't you get it? Right. Well, the thing was, Milt Maltz also knew all of this stuff, but he wasn't telling us anything right, because exactly. he was sworn to secrecy. Exactly. So uh, at any rate, uh, it, was, uh, it came down, I was now at uh, Channel 19, 
and it came down to about maybe about a month before it opened. And we said, how much access will local media have to the hall? And they said, unless you're an inductee, none. This is too big. We're going to have too many people. We said, well, you know, the, the, the owner of the station is not going to be happy about this. So we went out and we hired Mary Wilson of the Supremes to wow. be our reporter. Well, wow, that's amazing. And she was an inside track. And she loved it. And she knew all the people there, right. you know. Exactly. And then, uh, the, but the funny thing was, we were in a limo, and she said, "Take me to Leo's." And I said, "Leo's is no longer there. It's you know, it's, it's an empty lot now. And it, now there's a supermarket there." Okay. She said, "Take me there anyway." So we went there. We parked. She got out. She stood there for about five minutes to look. She said, "That's enough." That's enough. <laughs> Here's what happened. When the Glenville riots were happening, right. you know, and I mean, there was serious tension. Right, right. Leo's Casino catered to both white and black audiences, and they, they were there together for the same reason, right. to enjoy the music, and the Supremes were there that night. In the, we recall in, in broadcasting, and as, as listeners, you probably recall, especially the baby boomers, that CKLW in New York, oh, in, yeah, uh, rather sure. in Detroit, was uh, beaming all that good Motown music yeah. into Cleveland, and, and they were competing in ratings with our uh, stations in Cleveland. Good point. You know, I got to talk to Barry Gordy once, and this was at the Ron Curl Hall of Fame. He said what they would do is they would send their acts to Leo's Casino mm -hmm. because Cleveland audiences was, were very, you know, critical. Right. If he brought these people out, like, you know, the Temps and the Four Tops and Smokey, all their neighbors were there, exactly. and they loved them. Exactly. But if they didn't make it in Cleveland... They were in trouble. It's a test market. For yeah. Well, time. one day they had this young comedian opening up for the Supremes, and he had a couple of off-color off remarks. And Barry Gordy, who was about this tall, took and slammed him against the wall at Leo's. He said, you ever do anything in front like that in front of my girls again? It was Flip Wilson. <laughs> Very, oh, yeah, Flip yeah. Wilson, the comedian. But they would take you back for, for what they call their finishing school if you didn't make it. Right. So. No, and broadcasting, there was a lot of politics. Uh, Carl Stokes w oh, yeah. was the mayor for many years. And, sure. and of course, uh, they, he en ended up in New York City mm -hmm. and, uh, on WNBC. And back here as a judge. And back here as a judge and on Cleveland Municipal Court's bench. But uh, some of the broadcasters that uh, worked with, you know, some of the original broadcasters in, in Cleveland, um, there was WZAK, some of the original uh, uh, African American oh, broadcasters yeah, sure. did so well and, and moved, uh, you know, moved a lot of, uh, of uh, information through the community. Sure. You know, there was a, a station called WABQ, mm -hmm. and the call letter stood for We Are Better Qualified. Right. A tiny postage stamp of a station, but it right. served the neighborhood. Right. And uh, what happened was they had what they called a daytime signal. Yes. So that when the sun went down, they went off the air. Right. Well, when the Glenville riots were happening, the owner said, stay on the air. Right. He said, we have to reassure the public. Just tell the FCC, we, this is an emergency. Well, they got called up. Oh, wow. So they, they went to Detroit <laughs> to argue the case, and they, they said, you violated this, FCC you know, rules. Yeah. FCC rules. And they said, listen, we're here to serve the public. What greater public service was there than to calm the, the exactly, public? Exactly, exactly. And they said, you're right. That's true. Uh, WJMO was another active uh, oh, gosh, daytime yeah. station. Sure. Uh, African-American music and news. Uh, let's go to another book, but sure. first of all, I want to just tell the audience, uh, Forum 360, our program here, Global Outlook, Local View. The Global Outlook is media and uh, broadcasting and print journalism, and our local view is the greater Cleveland, Northeast Ohio, Akron, Canton, Youngstown area. Our guest is Michael Shevsky, an educator and an author as well as a broadcaster. Uh, we're going to go to another one of your books. Yeah, Mike. sure. And we're also going to talk about the Boomer magazines, oh, which yeah. are, uh, Mike is a uh, contributor and uh, very, very interesting. He always puts a trivia question for baby boomers to yeah, reflect there you on. Go. So let's have one trivia question about just a, let's say, how about a TV trivia? A and TV then trivia. at the end of our program, on Form 360, we'll discuss that. Okay, here's one for you. We all know Lynn Sheldon as? Barnaby. Barnaby, but he played a lot of different roles, including another kid show on Channel 5. All right, so that's going to be our question. That'll be our, that'll be our question. What was Lynn Sheldon's other on Channel program? 5, right. On Channel 5, all right. Uh, it's, that's going to move us right into your next book here, From Captain Penny to Superhost. Mm -hmm. And uh, Michael Shevsky with his wife Janice wrote the tales from the golden age of uh, Cleveland children's television yeah. and you know we think of all the cartoon programs that we used to watch but we had Ron Penfound. Talk a little bit about uh, Captain Penny. Wonder, wonderful uh, family too. In fact we were just with Matt Penfound uh, and, and his sister Tracy recently. The way we did this book was you know what was it like to be the kid 
that was involved with this. Right. So uh, Matt and Tracy, his sister, uh, actually did the, uh, the chapter about their dad. Perry Sheldon did one about his dad. Wow. And uh, Candy Lee Corn, at, who was the uh, co-host with Uncle Jake, Gene Carroll did one about right. uh, Uncle Jake. Right. Um, you know what, it, Captain Penny was pretty much what you saw on TV. Yes. I mean, there's Very urban legends so. you know, about all of these guys, but he was just the way he was on TV. And uh, it, it's kind of interesting too, because you talk to, we were talking to uh, his family, and I, I, I met his grandchildren, and they're just terrific. Madeline and Matt, you know, Tracy's right. kids, they're all terrific. They'd, they're what you would expect Captain Penny's grandchildren to be. Yes. They never got to meet him. He he died of lung cancer in right, 1974. Right, right, right. They were born in the 90s. But Dan O'Shannon, who wrote the, uh, the introduction for that, and who's doing a documentary with me about that, uh, he discovered there was no recording of Captain Penny saying you could fool some of the people some of the time, some of the people all the time. Right. That was his, uh, his sign-off. Yeah. yeah, sign off. There was no recording of that. But Dan, who was a producer out on the, on, on the West Coast for Cheers and Newhart and Modern Family, Be Positive, things like that, a guy comes up to him once at a party in California. He said, hey, you're from Cleveland. He says, do you have a way to dub off tape? He says, mm -hmm. I had this reel, but it's at one and seven, eight speed. My dad was on the, uh, the one o'clock club. And he says, I can do it. Well, it was eight hours of programming from Channel 5 from the early 60s, happened to have some including the whole Captain Penny. Wow. So his grandchildren got to hear him say, you can fool some of the people some of the time. Uh, that is uh, Captain Penny's. Interesting point. Do you know where that came from? Three different sources. No. One, you can fool some of the people some of the time. That came from Abraham Lincoln. Okay, there you go, President Lincoln. But you can't fool mom. That's different. I Spanky McFarland. Spanky and our gang. Yeah. <laughs> and the third part, she's pretty nice, she's pretty smart. You do what mom says and uh, you won't go far wrong. That was from Captain Penny himself, Ron Penfound. Wow, wow. And um, I always say that I met two of them. That and is they, amazing because, uh, you know, he always wore the, uh, the, the, tr uh, the train... Uh, yeah, conductor's hat, mm -hmm. or basically uh, the uh, the engineer's hat. I want to tell you something about that uniform. When he left Channel Five, and he even you know told everybody, "Look, I'm leaving. It's the end of the kids' shows. I got a job, you know, in New England, and all that sort of thing." Uh, there was a guy named Bob Seeley. Bob was a cameraman there, and he was a great pe Captain Fen Penny fan. He gave him the uniform, okay. and he even wrote on the box, "To Bobby, my best Captain." Penny. Something to give away. Well, a couple of years ago, Bob Seeley said, "I've had this in my family." For years, years right. and this belongs someplace and not in a collector. Contact him. I said, What about if, if you gave it to Matt Penfound? I said, Yes, of course. <laughs> Give it to the Penfound family. So I picked it up from Bob. My wife and I are taking it to Columbus because the Penfounds live in Columbus. And I said, Do you realize if the meteor hits this car, we've just lost a priceless artifact oh, of Cleveland Television. But we were able to give it back to the family after 50 years, and they have the, the Captain Penny outfit now. He was a great one. Uh, I always think of uh, Romper Room. Uh, Miss Barbara. Miss Barbara. Yes, of and, course. Um, of course uh, and of course, Gullardi. Uh, yeah. Ernie Anderson, the, the, one of the best voices in, uh, in all broadcasting. When he was on, and I, I strongly urge you, if you're a Gullardi fan, pick up Gullardi Inside Cleveland TV's Wildest Ride by Tom Farron and R.J. And R. Heldenfels. Great book, R.D. Heldenfels. Oh, yeah, it's a, another it's a good author. Great book, yeah. And uh, there's stuff in there that I thought I knew a lot about Goulardi. Wow, those guys cover it like you can't believe. We're also going to talk briefly about uh, uh, the Cleveland Radio. Tapes. Oh, yeah. So you came up with a couple of uh, books, but uh, uh, Michael Shevsky, talk a little bit about uh, who was the most influential broadcaster when you were growing up in Cleveland? And not Count Manalesco. But, uh, <laughs> no, not, but though he, he was a great influence. He was a different guy. <laughs> right. Uh, the Romanian. Uh, uh, that's a tough one to say, sure. okay? Because if you're looking at somebody that wasn't on the air, it was obviously the folks that owned Wixie. Right. Wayne Weiss and Golly, right. you know. Uh, but Norm Wayne. Uh, if you're talking about disc jockeys. In passed my, away recently. Oh, yeah, yeah. sadly. Yeah. Great man, too. Yeah. If you're talking about somebody that influenced me directly, mm -hmm. first of all, we had great names, and we had people like Bill Randall and people like that. We have great names. I would have to say it was probably Billy Bass, Milt Maltz. Okay. Milt Maltz owned uh, WMS, Billy Bass, and a guy named Doc Nemo. Doc, Doc Nemo, Nemo WXCN was, radio when he first started. Yeah, he was on MMS. Doc Nemo left Cleveland to become an actor. His, his greatest role is in the movie RoboCop 1 and 3 where he comes out and he says, I'll buy that for a dollar. <laughs> Everybody knows him for that. You know, it's funny you mention that too, Bill, because... Uh, I, I, my wife and I know a lot of other authors who are always talking to people at the pop conventions like Cinevent or Monster Bash, which is coming up right. uh, real soon. 
uh, check out the websites. But there's a guy named Frank Delostrito, and he writes books that reflect his own upbringing. Uh, he has one called, uh, I Saw What I Saw When I Saw It. Okay. And your reading is saying, wait a minute, this is my childhood. Yes, the okay. Bowery Boys and horror show hosts and Universal Monsters. We all share this, you know, right. this, this bond. And I strongly urge you to pick up those books if you can. But uh, that's why we do these books is because we want to say this was a special time in our lives and let's all share that. Right. And the greatest thing is when we're doing the pop culture conventions, people coming up and saying, you said something that really hit home. And it just makes you feel good. I want to talk a little bit about your other book here, uh, which brings Cleveland TV tales. And we're talking, originally, we just had three stations on oh, yeah. VHF. Sure. Three, five, and eight. Yeah. Right, correct. This is, people are buying this book just to get a picture of Dorothy Foldheim smiling. Right. But uh, she I was remember a, meeting her at Channel 5. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, she didn't put up any nonsense. I'll say that. I was, uh, when I was working in Cleveland Radio, and I was, yeah. and Norman Wayne was my, ultimate, our boss, and he told me to take Howard Cosell to meet uh, really? Dorothy, Dorothy Fulltime. So we went, and uh, Howard was actually brought in to uh, the studio, uh, yeah. and uh, Dorothy interviewed Howard Cosell. You know what, Dorothy... Because Howard was doing Monday Night Football. Oh, right. She, she did five books a week, okay? And she can't read five books a week, and she was really busy <laughs> otherwise. Very, very important journalist. Yeah. yeah. But she was on, and this is on YouTube... Uh, she was on the set with Jerry Rubin, the yippie. Mm -hmm. And uh, the funny thing was, uh, you know, she didn't know what his book was about. She says, do it, do what? And he goes into the whole, you know, they go, do this, do that. And it finally gets to the point where she says, that's enough. Slams her hand out. She throws him off the set. Right. So three weeks later, who comes through town? Abby Hoffman. Right. And she sticks her head and she said, you heard what happened to your friend? <laughs> and he said, yes, sir. <laughs> so he comes out and his hair is greased back. He's got this skinny tie. He's just looking at the camera like this. And everything she asked him, he, he had a book called Steal His Book. He answered, yes, sir, and no, sir. Right. So that by the end of it, even she was laughing. Right. Yeah, How, she, she had a command of the broadcast studio. Oh, yeah. Here's the thing, though, about Dorothy. A few weeks later, on May 4th, 1970, she's outraged by the events at Kent State. Right. She said, let's go down to Kent. Now, they didn't have satellite trucks then, but she brought a film crew down there. And she was there, and, and she actually went up to General Del Corso and said, how many students did you kill today? Mm meaning they weren't going to cooperate with the media anymore. But she went on the air and she said, and she, she called it for what it was. She said these were unarmed students. And she, she was obviously very passionate right, about it. Right. Phones lighting up. People were outraged at Dorothy. Mm -hmm. She came in the next day thinking, I'm getting fired. So she was there, and uh, Don Paris came in, who was the general manager. He said, Dorothy, we have to talk. She said, and you have to do what you have to do. <laughs> She and feared that there would be repercussions yeah. right there. He came up behind her, put his arms around her, and he said, here's what you have to do. Go home, get some sleep, we love you. Wow. And she, she never said this to Channel 5, or, nor her agent, but she said, I would never work in another place. Well, that's, a, that's an excellent yeah. uh, commentary about yeah, her, sure is. her uh, life, and, and very active in uh, Cleveland television. And of course, uh, she became a legend in the, oh, yeah. the journalism world in, sure. throughout these years. Now, this one is dear to my heart. Uh, oh, yeah, used to work, well, you got work some there, history there. But it was uh, Wixie 1260, uh, Pixies, Six Packs, and Superman, yeah. Michael Shevsky. Uh, Co-author would be uh, Richard Berg with the Carol Carlo Wolf. Wolf. Yeah. And uh, excellent book. And this was before FM radio uh, yeah. you know, became the dominant uh, radio. Sure. But uh, this is when radio, we still had Mike, we still had um, uh, rock and roll, we still had top 40 radio. Yeah. And uh, I want to thank uh, all the people that I used to work with there. Well, you know, radio stations from around the country used to drive up to, to Wixie, and, be, and it had a very directional signal. Right. I mean, I lived in Bedford, and you could walk to Northfield from there, and it would start deteriorating in Northfield, but it would boom into Toronto. Right. Go uh, across the lake. Go but uh, disc jockeys from other cities would drive up, listen to it, and then go back and uh, copy Wixie. Exactly. So now those are some of the programs that uh, we, in books we, as a matter of fact, I'm going to have, the, this is my original, so I'm going to have this autograph oh, you happy before to. the end sure. of the program. Yeah, but let's talk it. about, uh, we have about a couple minutes left. And uh, we want to talk about currently what you're doing with Boomer Magazine uh, coming up on the 50 Ways to Love Your Summer. This is the, the most recent. Uh, what, are you, uh, what are your expectations in writing? In, in, in you know what? We're all, boomers are growing by, you know, the, the, the numbers are... Maybe are, boomers are, everywhere. Yeah, they're huge, huge numbers. And we wanted to reflect to that and say, hey, you know, it's kind of fun being a boomer because we could sit back and maybe we have a little more expendable cash. We all have grandchildren. We share our, our problems. We share our, our, 
you know, our, our victories. And uh, we have the Boomer Bash every six <laughs> okay, months. Okay, oh, great, great. And it's like Woodstock with all the people coming out. And, you know, it's just great to say, hey, we're all in this together. And, you know, we all have concerns about a lot of things. I had somebody come up to me after an article I wrote where I said, what's ever happening in the movie theaters? Right. You know, and she said, I, I can't thank you enough for writing that. She says, we've got to bring the theaters back. Very good. But it's, you know, just reflecting, you know, Marie Elium is the uh, editor-in-chief. And uh, we always have great conversations about, you know, what are the directions of the boomers. And there's so many of them that, hey, you know, it's rich with potential, put it that way. And I want to thank uh, David Gray, your publisher. Oh, yeah, that's, good guy. Uh, done so much in bringing not only Michael Shevsky, but other authors yeah. from northern Ohio into prominence. And we learn so much. It's, it's history, living history. Yeah. And uh, Mike Olszewski, uh, who's taught Wait. at Kent State, Cleveland State, he, he is a teacher but he, and an educator, but he's also... Uh, that veteran broadcaster, great voice. Um, what's your project? We've got 10 seconds left. We're going to answer the trivia question. Okay. Barnaby, Lynn Sheldon, what was his other program? He was a hobo clown named Uncle Leslie. Uncle Leslie. And when he left, clown. they needed another host, so they brought in Ron Penfound. Hey, thank you very much, thank Michael Shevsky, for being a part of Forum 360. Forum 360 is brought to you by John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, the Akron Community Foundation, Hudson Community Television, the Rubber City Radio Group, Shaw Jewish Community Center of Akron, Blue Green, Electric Impulse Communications, and Forum 360 supporters.